Good morning again. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can start the slides up there, slide number one. that oh yes and inside your bulletin there's notes there uh, that you can jog some stuff down I probably got a lot more notes than what's needed but I, I over the years that you know I, I went back into my archives and pulled a bunch of things together for this year you know when Christ was with his disciples uh, he told his disciples, I must leave so that the comforter may come uh, for your benefit, for the benefit of the kingdom. And, and so there was a transition there, was there or not? And even the Godhead itself had a transition when Christ came here in the flesh. So, you know, there was change even in the Godhead. There was a transition, and there's a transition going on all the time, is it not? Uh, we're getting older, and, uh, and some of us getting a little bit slower. And uh, so there's transitions that we have to face all the time. And, and uh, the definition I want to read for transition here is, is not conquering, a transition is not conquering a challenge and completing a task. That's not a transition. It is understanding that transition is a constant and unsettling process that offers as all great journeys. See, a, a transition is a great journey. Uh, the chance of growth and renewal. Christ had to leave so that the disciples could grow and be continually renewed. They didn't quite understand a lot of it, but as time went forth, as time was forthcoming, then they started understanding things because even the scripture says the words of Christ would come back to them and then they would remember what he said to them. You know, we're going, we're making a transition right now from 2019 to 2020. A lot of you here, uh, hopefully this message will be beneficial to you individually but also as a church but many of you in here are you have your own businesses and and you know even within your own business the challenges that you have and the changes that go on all the time uh, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs in here entrepreneurs in here and you know uh, you're always faced with transitions so I just want to say that this year is a transition for growth and for renewal. Now, I've been collaborating with uh, Pastor Bill and Pastor David. We've been talking about this for some uh, weeks, months. And so even the church is going to be having a transition of sorts. Nothing jarring, but uh, I... Uh, and Donna will be going out more to establish relationships that we have our affiliations with. And so I'll be collaborating with Bill that while the times that I'm not here to make sure everything is being done properly and right, and, and I'm sure it will be. And Pastor David will be assisting Bill as we move forward. Uh, God is in the business of renewing and, and growth, right? So... I don't think you have to really think too hard about it. Uh, 
Sometimes God's got to come in and breathe new life, and that means a transition that takes place so that these things can happen. Growth and renewal can happen. How many of y'all have ever heard of the dimming, dimming's wheel? I thought I was looking at Ty because I, I think he's got, didn't you get your degree in management? You didn't? Okay, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know about it. The Deming's Will, he's the one that went over to Japan and, and revolutionized that whole country over there for the auto industry of which today most of us uh, or a good part of our marketing or our market is taken up with the Japanese vehicles. Uh, it wasn't that way at first, but they took Deming's principles. It's called the Deming's Will. Now, it's a little bit more sophisticated than this, but... In a transition, I want to give you some things. Uh, if you want to take notes, you can take notes. If you don't, that's fine too. But this was Deming's methodology, and I learned this back when I was taking leadership and management at the university and continued to do that. So it's called plan, do, check, and act. Plan, do, check, and act. Plan, you've got to define and establish the objectives. So in this transition, whether it's personal, even as a church, or in your business, you have to, def you have to define and establish what your objectives are in your life. You define issues and opportunities. You drill down deep and find out what the problems and the opportunities that you have and the root causes so that you can alter those things or modify those to make your business, your life, even the church better. Plan, do, check, and act. Do. Well, as you're investigating and you're finding out some of your objectives and you're looking and you're digging deep into some of the problems in your life, uh, or in your business or whatever it might be, then what happens out of that, you start doing dry runs for, to see if these are possible solutions. How many of you know you might have an idea or a concept and you apply that, but it, it's Dudsville. It doesn't go anywhere. Anybody that's in business knows this because you, you're constantly saying, okay, you got, you got competition. you got to be on the edge in the sense of being up with your competitors and you got to know what to do. Uh, this is true even with salespeople that we have here in the church. And I was talking with some of them this morning. You know, you got to get up and go get after it on your own. Every entrepreneur in here knows this, that if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to get up and make it happen. You know, nobody's sitting there back and giving you a handout. You're, you're going to get up, and every day it's a new day for you. Every day, it's a, it's a new challenge. Every day, it, there, you're faced with things that are good and, and things that are, are not so good. I know this from having my own insurance business. I know this because I had an electronics firm uh, that I was the president of. And every day, it's a new day. So a dry run for possible solutions until you find the right solution. How many of you know it's an experimentation sometimes? Check. Well, you want to check to verify uh, solutions that, that they're working. It's a back and forth verification. And with some of you guys in here that understand this, these principles of business, you know what I'm saying. Act. This is very important. Communicate new standards when you find the solutions and you know what it is you're going to do then you got to communicate new standards and requirements to everybody that's in your organization, even in your family. And it has to be done in such a way that it's, it's clearly communicated and simple. I had a, a friend that was a professor, and Lockheed came to her and said, we'd like for you to write our manual for our people on the assembly lines that we have making the parts that we're doing. And so she, they paid her, I forgot how much money, but anyway, she did it. And they came back and said, no, you need to 
what grade level is this, right? She wrote it, she started off at a freshman college level. And they said, no, it's still too complicated. So they asked her to redo it. So she went down to the 12th grade, and then she went down. You know where she ended up at before everybody on the assembly line could understand it so that there was production and efficiency? Sixth grade. See, sometimes you just got to make you know, things simple so people, you know, it's clear. You don't have to be professorial about everything. Are you with me? That... That always stuck with me when she shared that with me, this uh, particular English professor. So transitions, they can be with and they can be without miracles. Now, every transition in life doesn't have to have a miracle to it, right? Take the trash out, you don't need a miracle for that. <laughs> but, but, some, but, some but some transitions, uh, you need a miracle. And see, in the, in the scientific world or the atheist world, it's a closed system. In the Christian world, it's an open system, right? And we'll get to that here in a minute. So let me click this thing. I don't know. I got to click it. Oh, they already went there. All right, good. I don't even have to mess with it. So in this transition, Newton's law of gravitation tells me that if I drop an apple, what's it going to do? It will fall towards the ground, center of the earth. It's like an invisible string on it, pulling it down, right? But that law does not prevent someone intervening and catching the apple as it descends. You see, in the atheist world, these immutable laws of physics, they say it's a closed system. That's why they don't believe in miracles. But see, who says that God can't reach out in your life and catch the apple as it's falling? And therefore, in the Christian life, we believe in miracles. We need miracles. I, hey, everybody in here, I'm sure, that has, has a testimony of something where God has intervened. When the apple was falling, God reached out and caught the apple. He's the, he's the giver. He's the maker of all these physics, these laws of physics. Why can't he also intervene? Now, I can take $5, put it in my desk. The next day, put $5 in there. The next day, put $5 in there. Four days in a row. Well, I, I, the laws of arithmetic are I got $20 in there, right? But what if I come back the next day and there's $5 in there? Well, the conclusion is there's a thief somewhere. So you, you see what I'm saying when they make this argument that these laws are immutable and they cannot be changed, it just simply is not true. Even a thief like the devil can come in and alter something that shouldn't have been normal. He says he comes to what? And he's, and he's good at it. He wants to steal your dignity, your ideas. He wants to steal the things that God has put in your heart. And he's very clever at it. And by the way, it doesn't show up with uh, horns and a pick, pitchfork. He comes as an angel of light. He'll come to you in terms of theology and make it sound all religiously. I mean, you know, this is good. This is religious. And his purpose is to thwart what God's really wanting to do in your life. I'll let that sink in a little bit. I remember the story of James Dobson. Everybody in here, I think, knows James. He's driving home from his, when he got his Ph.D. in psychology. And this is his story. This has always stuck with me because he, he gave some safeguards for uh, believers for prayer to make sure you're not being deceived. So he's driving back. He's in his uh, VW Bug. And an audible voice came to him and said, somebody close to you is going to die. Now, he's a Christian. I mean, one of the happiest days of his life, he just graduated and he's going home. Uh, been, 
you know, at hard work at the, you know, at going to the university to get his PhD for 12 years. And so then all of a sudden, an audible voice, this is him, this is his testimony, an audible voice came to him. How many of you know that Satan can talk in an audible voice? Don't think he can't. I mean, it's obvious if he would come to you and say, he's not going to come to you and say, I hate your guts, I'm going to kill you, or these kinds of things. He's going to come to you in a very subtle way. We're talking about transitions here for your business, for your life, and for this church. We've got to understand that there's the supernatural of God whose hand can reach out and grab the apple before it hits the ground. And this is what we're talking about here in terms of a transition. As we go forward as a church, individuals and businesses that are in here, God wants to take his hand and catch the apple before it hits the ground. Amen? Here's another thing I want you to understand about something about the character of God. And probably most of you have never heard of this. God doesn't do anything arbitrarily. Did you hear what I said? He doesn't do things arbitrarily, and also he doesn't have any favorites. So, Newton's law, it's a law of physics, but also God can reach out and grab that apple. Amen? So, <clears throat> there is something that... that that all of us need to know in a transition, how do we protect ourselves? See, like with James Dobson, when he got that audible voice in that car, he said that the first thing came to him was, my dad's going to die. Because it's audible, it's got to be God. Second was, was that him and his father had a very, very close relationship. They were best friends. And he just putting, assuming things, right? You know, assumptions can lead you astray. And so, the reason why he wrote this book is because of how many years he wasted believing something that was not from God. It was audible. First thing he assumed, it's got to be my dad because somebody that's close to you is going to die. And so, I'm going to shorten the story here, but 13 years later, talking about 13 years later, he, he was walking, waiting for his dad to die, or somebody like his mom, or somebody else that was real close. 13 years. You see, Satan wants to bound you up in your mind and give you things to prevent you from really transitioning in terms of the fullness of what God's wanting to do in your lives and in our lives. That's why it's imperative that God has instilled in his word to, uh, 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 principles to protect us in this. So what Dobson learned out of that is, is that first you take it to the word of God. You go to the word. The second thing is you submit it to leadership. Now, let me share something with you. Leadership is not Aunt Susie in New York. She might be a sweet little lady, but she's not. If you're in a church, what Dobson in his book talked about, to protect yourself the best way of knowing whether or not you're making a right decision, you submit things to uh, leadership. Of course, you pray with your spouse. You submit it to the word of God. Then you submit it to leadership to be in prayer with you about this decision, transition that you're about to make, right? And then the next thing is you, without broadcasting it to everybody, then you wait for confirmations. Because confirmations, God will bring, when you submit yourself this way, you activate a gift that's in leadership. And what happens out of that activation of that gift is that you will get answers. You'll get confirmations. 
And then here's, here's the last one that most of us have a problem with, especially if it's a hard decision, and that is to wait. Wait for the right timing. I got a good friend that when I met him, uh, he was 25% owner of a thousand fortune company. And they were in an impasse with their corporation, their organization, and they were getting ready to close their doors. They were getting ready to, to go under. And it was amazing because I asked him, this friend of mine, and, st and still we are still friends, well, what did you do to get your business turned around? Because they went from a 1,000 fortune company to a 500 fortune company in one year. And so I asked him, how did y'all do this? He said, well, the first thing we did, there was four owners. He, he owned 25%, and the others, I don't know what their percentages were. But each one of them were, all four of them were Christians. And every one of them, the first thing they did, they called in their pastors, their leadership, that God placed over them. God knows what he's doing if we'll just listen to him. And so he said they came in, they told these four pastors from different churches, but spiritual head, right, spiritual leadership, and told them what the problem was. And then after that, they started doing the practical things. First, they got, took care of the spiritual thing. God can catch the apple. And then they started doing the practical things. They started getting a hold of Wall Street. What do we got to do? Getting a hold of their banker. Getting a hold of other people to get the expertise on a practical plane of what it is that they need to adjust and to do. But the most important thing is they called in their spiritual leaders to pray. You know what happened? This is what he told me. Within 48 hours, everything got turned around. God has given us protection in our lives for our families and for ourselves. Can I get an amen or an oh, oh, get out of here or whatever? Do you remember the, uh, the Israelites? When they were, in, they were in a transition, they were going through the desert, they were going into the promised land. The ones that got picked off were the stragglers. Uh, it's interesting, I've always been a fan of, of war and battles and, you know, I spent 30 years studying leadership. I've read over 1,500 biographies on leaders. I don't know everything, but I know a little bit. And so in the Bataan March that happened in the, Phil the uh, Philippines, that was the largest surrender in U.S. history. And they took them on this 65-mile march. And the ones that didn't keep up, they shot them and killed them or cut their heads off. And this is what I learned from this, is that every situation in every war where there was a captivity, such as the Bataan March, the Gulag in Russia, and also the concentration camps in World War II. My dad was in one of them, by the way. He was a POW. Here's the, here's the key thing, the key thread through all of it, the ones that survived. If you didn't have a buddy, then you were going to die. So the ones that had a buddy system going on, they survived that horrific ordeal that they went through. The church, God has given us, that's, that's on a practical plane. If you, if you go read anything about the Bataan March, when one was sick, the, the, the other buddy would minister to them and take care of them and bring him back. When he was sick, the buddy would do the same thing for him. There's protection when we do it in the proper way. So, you know, there's... Uh, when we do a transition, and even in our faith, don't let people cut, cut you down and say, well, you're a Christian, you just got blind faith. 
I don't have blind faith. I got faith that's based on evidence. There's more forensic science that prove the existence of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection than almost any other uh, event in history. We all know Rome existed, and it's got one-sixteenth of, of the existence of archaeological findings in terms of proving that Rome existed, but we know Rome existed. So when, they, when the atheist wants to come out and say, no, there is, everything's a closed system, you're not going to get any miracles in a transition. And I'm telling you, in the Christian life, we expect the miracles because we have a miracle-working God. And I and you and everybody here in this church included and every other church that loves Jesus Christ, we got to have the intervening hand of God to catch the apple in our lives. And by the way, I wouldn't have it any other way. Because when God intervenes and you know his hand intervened from the apple hitting the ground, guess what we do? We get to brag on him. We get to talk about his goodness. We get to lift one another up and encourage one another. We don't leave anybody behind. So, you know, like the stragglers with the Israelites, those were one, they didn't, they weren't part of the group. They weren't part of the buddy system. They weren't prepared. And so they were stragglers. They didn't have water. They didn't have food. They didn't have a buddy system. And so the Ammonites just picked them off. The devil will do the same thing. So you're going through a hard time. God's built in certain things to help protect you in a transition. And we're going to talk about some of them here in a minute. Now, just so that you know, if I haven't mentioned this, over the next course of six, seven weeks, I, we're going to be talking about transition. It's time that our church did a transition in every aspect. I mean, I'm talking about faith, believing, and what God's wanting to do. So if God is speaking to us, which we believe he is, about this transition, then we got to be obedient so that growth and renewal can come into our lives. Anybody that's in here a business, a business owner, you know at times you've got to revamp. When I had my two businesses that I had, I was constantly revamping because of the competition. If you don't, you're going you're gonna to end up dying. It's the same way with our personal growth. Miracles are a type of transition, by the way. We're making transitions from 19 to 2019 to 2020. Our country is in a transition. The businesses are in transitions. Churches across America are in transitions. There's transitions going on all around us. Even the cosmos, inanimated objects, are expanding and changing every nanosecond. Well, how do we protect ourselves, our businesses, the church in a transition. There's an umbrella that God's put over us. It's called the Holy Bible. And uh, Timothy 3.16, it says, all scriptures God breathed. Uh, Carl, if you don't mind, could you bring me some water? Thank you, sir. Um, all scripture is God breathed. Now, as Christians, it's an astounding uh, thing to me in the sense that only 62% of Christians in churches even believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And it keeps getting less and less every year. 
Well, if you don't apply the word of God in your life, you're not going to have the power of God in your life. And then we can become a secular church and deny the power and the miracles of God. Is this too heavy or is this okay? So, the Holy Bible, the Word of God, we, that has to be our bedrock. Now, you can see there I've got gifts, counselors, prayer, and leadership. That's above the line. That's those spiritual things like I was talking about this owner called in their leaders. Thank you. Below the line is the practical things that you got to do. How many of you know the spiritual and the practical go together? Like a marriage, this spiritual union. But there's a lot of practical things that's got to go on <laughs> within that spiritual union to make sure that that spiritual union is strong and it stays intact. Same way with the church. The church is a spiritual union that we're married to Christ, but then there's practical things that we all got to do to make sure that stays intact and it's vibrant and it's alive. We're not to be the Dead Sea. Everything comes in, nothing goes out. There's an old saying by the old divines, the light shines the brightest at home when it's sent out. One of the reasons why Don and I will be going out visiting and strengthening our relationships with Robert Duran and Dr. Stan and Howard Foltz and Terry Thompson and all these other people that, we're, that we are associated with. So, gifts. I mentioned this earlier. How do you activate a gift? So, here's a guy that lost his wife, lost his job, lost his home, and he's broke. He has no money. I would say that guy's pretty down in the dumps, wouldn't you? But what he did was he called his pastor. Because in Hebrews it says, submit to the authorities that have been placed over you so they may go well with your soul. Is that optional? Only if you're a Sunday fair Christian it is. That's a command. That's something that God says. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do anything the Bible says. But if, you, but if you'll submit to that, what you do, just like with this guy who lost his wife, his home, his job, no money, he called, he went to his, submitted to his pastor. Submit doesn't mean you're under somebody's thumb. It means I'm going to act up, make that gift that's in you. Because God's going to work through headship, and he always has. I didn't set it up. It's right there in the Bible. He's the one that says, as he wills, he wills, he appoints the pastors, apostles, and so forth and so on. Not man, not an institution, the Holy Spirit does. And so when we do this thing correctly, and if you're in a flux or you're unsure about things, uh, the worst thing to do is get off by yourself. Because you can get some answers, I'll guarantee you, but there ain't going to be the answers that would be forthcoming if you did it God's way. Did you know this man, just like the story of Job, this man within eight months got everything back. Well, his wife didn't come back to life. But, but, but he got everything back. New relationship. Home and was making three times more the money that he was when he, the job that he lost from. If we'll do it God's way, God will protect. And God will have growth and renewal. God is not in the business of cutting off relationships. He's not in the business of, of doing any harm to anybody. The devil, that's his playground. 
That's not God's playground. God's playground is to say, come on. I know what's best for you. I'm going to put you in the right function for where you need to be at so that you can be that rock fitted into that wall, right? We're all fitted into this living wall, living organism. Listen, we're all contingent beings. You know, there's 50 different professions that you're dependent on. At least 50. Think about, you need doctors, you need, right? You need water, you need food, you need the farmer, you need, you can go down the list. What about in the church? See, the biggest problem we got in America today is individualistic-ism. And we got the Christianese language down and the bumper sticker and all that, but then we are not applying what God said to do to get victory in a transition. Ephesians 4.11, those of you taking notes. And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, and some pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, edifying, the edifying of the body of Christ till we come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man to the measure and the stature, stature of the fullness of Christ, that he should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitfulness of plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in things into him who is the head, Christ. Y'all getting the picture here? Now, in other words, none of us here have arrived. And so we all need, we're contingent on these protections that God has given us. Like I said, you don't have to do it. from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth for the body and the edifying of itself in love. Proverbs 24, 6, those of you taking notes, for by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. As I was mentioning before, you don't go out and get your own counselors don't have any sweat, blood, and tears with you. Aunt Susie might be a nice lady up in New York, but she's not the one that's been placed in your life in terms of these spiritual things that we're talking about. Your next door neighbor might be a great guy, but he's not someone as that he's saying, go get counsel. Anybody can go get counsel. I can go get counseling from a 13-year-old. But that doesn't mean that I'm following his prescription. My son, eat honey because it is good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to your taste, he's talking about the Word of God, the principles that you live by. So shall the knowledge of wisdom, the knowledge of wisdom that you're going to get from eating this honey, be to your soul. And if you have found it, if you have found it, there is a prospect and your hope will not be cut off. And I get a big amen on that or I'll do it. Here's another one that's underneath an umbrella, prayer. The disciples saw the prayer, the power of prayer in Christ's life. So they went to him, teach us how to pray. And he said, all right, pray this way. He didn't mean a formula. Matthew 6, 8, Therefore do not be like them, talking about the hypocrites, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father... Come on. As it is in heaven.
Amen? That's a mouthful that Christ has given them. We have to have, all of us need to have protection. Do you know that any one of us in this room, uh, you know, it, it's very easy to deceive yourself. You know, you can have a desire for something so strong, it will deceive you. Do you know, Christ said this, if you keep your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life for me, for my sake, you will find it. Do you know you never find anything seeking it because within the seeking of something like, let's say, to uh, seeking a healing or seeking uh, money or seeking success, with, built within that are the seeds of destruction which will implode on you because you're seeking it. Instead, what Christ says, get a hold of these cardinal virtues to develop your character on the inside and get the skill set that you need and that will follow you. This is where the verse comes from. You are known, your reputation goes before you. You don't have to, you don't have to go out and advertise or whatever. Does that make sense to you? Well, part of this is leadership. Obey those who rule over you. And be submissive. Again, it's not about being underneath somebody's thumb. For they watch out for your souls. I've got to give an account for everybody in this room. I take it serious. I really do. I really do. I've got to give an account for everybody that's in this room for your souls. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. This is where you activate the gift. You, you know, you get the prophet or the teacher or, or the, the pastor or the bishop or whoever. This is where you activate the gift. I'm not walking around with all kinds of knowledge. No, somebody comes and says, hey, I got this. Bam, the Holy Spirit comes upon me in the position of the office. I'm not anybody special. I'm here because God appointed me here. You know what? I never wanted it. Let me tell you the first, the first sign or the very first uh, qualification for being a leader. You don't want it. By the way, that's Plato. Because see, if you seek and got to advertise that you're the leader or you should be the leader, you're not the leader. So we had a gentleman that way back here at the church, uh, he uh, was going to church here and I worked with him in the corporate world. He was our HR manager and I used to watch him. And a lot of you know who he is. And he'd be the first one there at work, he'd be the last one usually to leave. I would watch him and see him do things that were menial tasks that was not his job description, but he did it anyway. Why? Because of the character that he'd been developing inside of him. And what he would do is pick up the trash, do these things, these menial tasks. And so he got promoted from being the HR manager to being the manager of underwriting of where I was at. And we all went out to a place and had lunch at a Chinese restaurant, of course. And then afterwards, all the corporate boys there, we came out. And in the midst of all these corporate boys, I told him, you're going to be the president of this company. He just retired about three years ago, I think. Guess what it was? He became the president of one of the divisions of the company. 
and it's not because of anything other than the fact that he 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 used to he used to he had a, he was over a ministry here in the church. He did it with excellence, just like he did his, what he did with his job, his work at, in the corporate office. I asked a guy one time that had was over forty five thousand people. I said. I didn't know it at the time. I said, how many people here work? He goes, but half of them. I said, well, how do you know the ones that are working and the ones that are not? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, you can look around, and, and the ones that are high-stepping it, they're going somewhere. They got a mission to do. They're going to accomplish something. The other ones that look like they got the seven-year itch, and you don't know if they're ever going to make it. Right? Some common sense, isn't it? As this is going on above the line, the spiritual things that are above the line, the gifts, the counselors, the prayer, the leadership, below the line is your personal development, and that's where the practical things come in. Accelerate your learning. God is not going to bless a lazy person. That ain't your grandma or your grandpa. That's God himself. Because this is what Jesus said. If you're faithful with a little, I'll give you more. If you're faithful with that, I'll give you more. So accelerate your learning. Fit your strategy to your situation. Not every strategy is appropriate in the sense that all one size fits all. You've got to have a strategy that fits the situation you're currently in. Then you have to get alignment. You got to have people that are with you to buy in and gain alignment of where you're going. Now y'all should know this just from being husbands and wives, the ones of you that are in here that are married. You're not going anywhere if your wife or your spouse is not in alignment with you. It doesn't mean that you you have unanimity and everybody agrees on every aspect. What it means you got a spirit an attitude of that spirit that you're going to find out the solutions, you're going to exhaust those things and talk about them, but then somebody's got to make a decision. And this is where alignment comes in and you take off. By the way, don't ever make your spouse out to be an idol or your children. Right there in that Holy Bible that we read. You'll love them. You'll take care of them. He's put them in your care, right? But don't make them out to be an idol. I tell Don all the time, don't make me out to be your idol. You're going, to get a, you're going to get a short stick on this thing. Then there's where you got, when, when this is coming together, some of this stuff doesn't mean it's, like you do this, this, this. Some of this is kind of ebb and flowing together. But then out of this, this is what comes. You are able to establish a direction in where you're going. Anybody need any direction in their life? I know I do. That's part of the transition. Like what Pastor Dave was saying here was uh, it means a challenge, it means change. Right? So you got to get a direction in your life, where you're going, what you're going to do. And you get that out of that. This is actually my favorite slide. The greatest transition in history. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The empty tomb. Those of you that are taking notes, all transitions have three phases to it, which they go through and embed it into these three phases are four main guiding principles. There are three phases. Here they are. There's an end. We just ended 2019. 
If we, if we look at this with Christ, there came, there came a time the life of Christ ended. He was crucified for your sins and my sins. Forensic evidence on that in terms, let me give you a book to read. It's called The Day That Christ Died. It had, it, this is by a physician that wrote this in the 50s, and it's nothing just packed all the way through the book about the forensic evidence of the death and burial and ascension of Jesus Christ. You know, you've got things in life that are uh, what, what they call reduction and abduction. Reduction is a, uh, something that you can repeat. For instance, you got a copper kettle on the stove, water's boiling. And somebody says, why is the water boiling? And then you have a scientist in the room and they say, well, you know, the heat is applied to the copper and there's water in there and the molecules are bouncing around each other and it's going to cause a boil. Scientifically, he's given an explanation and that's correct. Ah. But then you ask the question again, why is the water boiling? I want a cup of tea. That is just as valid of an explanation as the scientific explanation. And matter of fact, you can't get a true picture of anything and if you don't have the both. You gotta have the two. Jesus Christ. You know, you can walk in water and you can take the heat out of the water. You ever heard of ice cubes? Well, he created it, why can't he take it out? An end, and then at, when something ends, there's an idle time. Like right now, we're kind of like in a time of idle, and I call it flapping of the wings. And the reason why I picked that is because of this, uh, of this theory. In South Africa, see, seasons are changing, right? You know, winter, spring, summer. Texas, our weather changes every day. You wake up, it's winter. By noon, it's uh, spring. And by, you know, as you go on, I mean, we get all four seasons here in Texas. We just get it all in one day. But in this idle time, the flapping of your wings, there's millions of butterflies that gather uh, in South Africa. There's a booklet out called The Butter fly effect you can get that it's a great book and this applies to I want you to put this in, metaphorically speaking I want you to look at this as us together as a church your business your organization whatever it is that you've got these butterflies in South Africa they all get there's millions of them they start flapping their wings during, during a certain time of the season of the year and as they're flapping their wings, what they have found out, it will cause a disturbance in the atmosphere that ends up moving forward and increasing in intensity that causes a hurricane in the oceans. Look at the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us. And if we will be obedient to Him and submit ourselves to His authority, then each one of us can flap our wings. It will cause some commotion, some disturbance. But what if we're all doing it? You with me? Why are we limiting God? We are limiting God because we have a limited mind. God is all-powerful if he is, then why don't we take him at his word for it? And don't be a victim. Because that brings a, a small mind. If you become a victim, let me tell you something, you're not going to be able to bust out. Quit being a victim. God doesn't want you to be a victim. So the flapping of the wings, the butterfly effect. 
if all of us start flapping our wings together in unison and asking the Holy Spirit to come, and by the way, don't put up frivolous prayers, heal my grandma's ingrown toenail, but really pound heaven with reason and ask God to move to save this nation and save our young people, right? I'm telling you, we'll see things happen. God's waiting on us. And we're sitting back here, we're waiting on God. It ain't going to work that way because God is saying, I want you to move. I want you to flap your wings. Can I get an amen? Amen. And then guess what comes out of that? You get, you get the movement and the atmosphere changing and moving and, and the force from these natural phenomenon of a hurricane happening. What do you think is going to happen in the spiritual realm? It means renewal. It means us coming alive. Instead of being religious and having some religious form, but we can become alive. Why? Because we see the effects of the hurricane. And these kids, our kids, the ones that are in this room and the ones that are not here, it's for them. I'm putting some intensity on it. I'm not mad. Now, what are the four principles that's embedded, embedded into these three phases? And you can put your own terminology in it. This is true with every business, organization, church, whatever. There's the four principles. Well, let me just put them up there. Oh, there they are. Wheat falls into the ground and dies. Jesus said unless a a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it cannot reproduce. The eye and the pride has got to die. Unless we die to ourselves and what I think I should be getting, what it, what, what, the way I should have this or that or whatever. It's about him. And then there's a burial. Burial. Because, you know, there's a time in your life you go and say, you know what, I'm going to kill this thing. (laughs) We're going to have some rest here, and the way we're going to get some rest, we're going to bury this thing, whatever it is. Then, just like with Jesus, they put him in the, the tomb. Did you know they wrapped him, right, like a mummy? Very tight. And then they put 250 pounds of spike nard and things like that on top of him to keep him preserved for his burial. Then when Mary and uh, uh, Martha showed up, the tomb was already open. Guess what? This is a prophetic picture of you and I individually and as also as a church. We're not dead. And then when they showed up, it says this. Here's the forensic evidence again. It said as if he came right straight through that cloth and everything, and the cloth that he was wrapped in collapsed. I'm sharing that with you because a lot of folks are think, oh, it's a swoon theory. He wouldn't really did, really. Wrapped up like a mummy, 250 pounds of spike nard on you, and you're, you're going to come free and get all alive again. Give me a break. See, sometimes we've got to bury ourselves. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I'm risen with Christ. I also am buried with Christ. I need to be wrapped in that that mummy wrap and all that stuff and get the spike nard and wait for my official burial by the Holy Spirit. And then he'll open up the tomb. 
and let people come in and say, wait a minute, we know this snaggletooth dude. Because God wants to be a witness here on the earth for, of a miracle that can happen in your life for others that are not saved yet. And he'll open up the tomb of your life so everybody can look in and go, wait a minute, something ain't right here. We got to start making up some stories to make sure that nobody buys into this. Can I get an amen or something? Go home or tell me to do something. And you know what happens out of that process? Then you will arise. You will ascend. Does not the scripture say we're seated with Christ in heavenly places? By the way, that is a form of a rapture. I'll leave that at that. For those of you, of course there's going to be a physical rapture. But when all those that are born again that name Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, you've already been raptured up into the heavenlies. We need to quit acting like we're still in death or in... in Y'all understand what I'm saying? We're seated with him. And we, sometimes we get it all messed up. Really, it's simple. We got to die, folks, and live for one another, love one another. Stephen Covey has a book out called The Speed of Relationships. And in it, the simple concept is this. Organizations can, if you build relationships amongst you, of trust, if you build relationships amongst the Holy Spirit, not Stephen Covey saying that because he's a secular dude, but what he's trying to get at through relationships that are knitted together, your, the process can speed up so much faster. Doesn't that make sense? It does to me. Mike knows what I'm talking about, just being in the car dealership. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Here it is. Go to the next slide. Here it is. Let's all read it together. This is in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 15, 17. And if Christ has not risen, yeah. You know what they were saying? They were taking a, Paul was taking a stand here saying, we know he's risen. That's what he was saying because some were coming and saying that Christ had not risen, trying to wreck their faith. I'm going to tell you something. If Christ had not, has not risen, then we are pitiful. But he has been risen. Without the message of the resurrection, there is no faith in Christ. Without the message of a resurrection in your life and in my life, there is no message of the resurrection. There is no message of a transition. A transmission, transition means this. I was here, but I'm not there no more. I'm over here. Because God stuck his hand out and caught the apple for me. And did not let it fall to the ground. Don't tell me there's no, there's no miracles today. Christians do not believe that the universe is a closed system of cause and effect. It's part of it. They believe that it is an open system of the causal activity of the creator God. It's an open system. This is why you and I, right as we close here and we sing a song to the Lord, God, if we please his heart and come to him and be submissive to him and do what he says, don't pick and choose because you'll get deceived. 
See, it's a year of transition. I'm trying to share these things with you so that you can protect yourself. This church can protect itself. These are some simple principles to go by that God's put in there. I just gave you some anecdotal stories of a guy that lost everything and God put it all back in him because he submitted to his head pastor. And then I told you about another guy that went from a thousand fortune fi- company on the verge of bankruptcy and went because all those owners of that company realized they needed to bring all four pastors in and they prayed and they got their answer in 48 hours. Your business might be in an impasse and you don't know what to do. But, I, but he knows. I'm not the answer man. I'll tell you right straight up first. I'm not the answer man. I do know this. Things come out of me when it's activated. Not because of me, because it's his office. I'd keep you humble that way, see? You don't think you get a big hit. You know, Moses never wanted to be the leader of Israel. Nobody in the Bible ever sought to be a leader. God sought them out. It's right there. You can go read it. That's why I said early on, if, you're, if you have to campaign that you're the leader or you whatever, you're disqualified already because you need to develop the virtues and the, character, the cardinal virtues inside and your skill set so that God can promote you in due season. Why don't we all stand and hopefully I made sense. Now I'm going to regurgitate some of this again next Sunday because how many of you know it's good to hear something a couple of times so it gets down in your spirit. I'm asking you to do something. Show up for these next uh, six weeks, seven weeks. Now I know people get sick and all that. Don't worry about it. We got some out today that are sick, but You can catch it on YouTube. We got 25 subscribers on YouTube, and when I was doing the analytics, we usually on average have anywhere from 8, 9, to 17 people watching us. By the way, hello. Thank you for tuning in. Amen? And, you know, God is what I'm telling you, God's wanting to do something in you and in us and in the church. He said, if you'll take care of my house, I'll take care of your house. Is he a liar? You know, I I mean, (laughs) you know, God's trying to get something. I'll just say, he's trying to get something in my thick head. Open up the box and quit limiting God. Believe in what he says. Test him and prove him and see. He said, bring, bring your solutions, bring your, I mean, your solutions, but your problems. God's not arbitrary. He says, come, Isaiah 118, come, let us reason together. Notice, he did say, let us feel together. He said, let us reason together. Through the headship of what he set up. Pastor Dave, would you lead us into a song? Come on up here and just as we go into the song, I'm asking you to just humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before the Lord. And ask the Lord to come and minister to you. Listen, we need each other. Every one of us, we need each other. And, the, and Slewfoot doesn't want us to have relationships. He doesn't want us to come together. He doesn't want us to see the best in each other. He doesn't want to see what our functionalities is so that it benefits this person.
So your gift and your function benefits this person. This person's gift and function benefits this person. And when we do this cross-pollination, everybody's lifted up. That's what it means in, in Ephesians where it says, come together in hymns and songs, encouraging one another, lifting one another up. That's the spiritual side of things. But how about people that come in and have the gift of hospitality, the gift of helping, the gift of administration, the gift, all these different functionalities that we need and we're contingent on. And nobody gets a big head about it. He's the head. He's the head. And then as we function together and bless one another, I think what we get, that prophetic picture that's in Psalms 133, where Moses is setting, pouring the oil on Aaron's head and it's coming down off his head. That's the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about us as a body. A body that believes him, believes his word, and it says it flows down through the whole body. The Holy Spirit covers the whole body. What does that mean? Nobody's insignificant. Amen. Amen. And it's amazing at the end of that, God says this, when that happens, that means it's doable. That means it can happen. He said, when that happens, there I will command a blessing. And let me tell you something, when God stands up in the throne of heaven and he commands a blessing on this church, not a demon or a devil or nothing's going to stop it because he commanded it he commanded it it's not us will will and you know doing willpower and all that or walking around i'm the big cheese here no that's not let's get over this stuff we're not like the gentiles where we have a pecking order we're supposed to be like Christ who come to serve, not to be served. One of the greatest transitions ever took place was with John Newton, slave ship driver, mm -hmm. responsible for the death of many, to a pastor and an author. It took amazing grace, didn't it? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Let's give him a hand clap. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. I hope, uh, I hope you got ministered to today. Go in the peace of the Lord. God bless every one of you. And let's always remember we need one another. Love y'all. Bye-bye.